Good afternoon. Today is March 25th, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today John R. Bauer. Welcome, John. Thanks for coming. May I ask you when and where you were born? Natick, I uh, actually was born in Boston, uh, July 17th, 1954. But when I was very young, three, four years old, my parents moved from Boston, took the whole family to Natick, and still my hometown. So Natick, back in the 50s and 60s versus today, tell us what you think. A lot of changes? Oh, very dramatic changes, yes. Uh, we're in North Natick on Lake Kachichuit, so that little neighborhood where we're in is uh, short dead-end streets. And we're surrounded by the Lake Kachichuit State Park, Camp Mary Bunker, <coughs> and the Evergreen Road area, Evergreen Park. So it's just a small, kind of like a cul-de-sac. It wasn't built as a cul-de-sac. That neighborhood is known previously as Camp Pleasant. And uh, when Lake Kachichu was built as a reservoir for Boston, uh, it was developed as summer cottages. You know, there were no highways going to the Cape, or you know, there wasn't tourism very far away. People didn't travel great distances, so they came from Boston to recreate and vacation on Lake Kachichu. And there's still some of the old cottages there that have been evolved into homes, and it's still a growing neighborhood. How about the downtown area? And you're near Route Nine, so yeah, north side of Route Nine. You've yeah. seen a lot of build up there, also. Yeah, I remember when we first moved to Natick, uh, there was a farmhouse where Stop and Shop is now, and they had sheep. You know, I remember the farmhouse and the sheep there, where Foreign Motors West is now on North Main Street was a large apple orchard, and uh, you know those corner stores and things like that the farms. And did you go through the Natick school system? Yes. And when did you graduate? 1974. And what is your marital status? Single, divorced. Do you have children? No. Where and when did you enter the military? In Boston. Uh, I had, um, see at that time uh, in the mid-70s, uh, there was the stigma of the Vietnam era and all that negativity. And uh, my interest in the military started early. Uh, you know, I was an active, uh, political, motivated kid in high school, you know, joining clubs and organizations that were political oriented. and. We did things like went and bought flags. I remember when Jordan Marsh had the big dome there on Route 9, we went there and bought flags and went into the big um, Vietnam veterans protest against the war at Boston Common uh, in the Nixon era. And uh, matter of fact, my one of the friends that we went with borrowed the flag I bought and he wrapped it around himself and he got his picture on the front page of the Boston Herald. Now, were you and, there to support the war or against the war? Uh, we were against the war. Uh, but we were also there to support the veterans. Uh, my interest in the military started kind of young um, because uh, my grandparents, you know, uncles were in the military, grandparents were in the military, uh, especially my grandfather from Canada. He was in the British military. And my mother's relatives, uh, she had their medals and things and that they had saved. <clears throat> but none of my siblings were, none of my immediate relatives or cousins were at the time. Uh, but I had two older brothers who were about four and five years older than I was. And they had older friends who had come home from Vietnam. And I was kind of a wild kid, you know, I would be sneak out at night and run away for weekends at a time and things like that. And I just hung out with their older friends who were coming back from Vietnam. So, you know, I heard their stories and um, had, you know, had they had befriended me, although I was quite, you know, much younger, uh, I did hang out with that older crowd when, you know, when they would let me tag along or they'd drag me along. 
And uh, so that's where my, I think my first interest in the military began. So after high school, you graduated in 75, did 74. you? 74, I'm sorry. I graduated in high school in 74, but then I went on to Bridgeton Academy in North Bridgeton, Maine for a year and graduated there in 75. Uh, I then entered Framingham State College in 76. And it was while living back at home and at Framingham State that I became interested in the GI Bill because the GI Bill was due to expire on December 31st, 1976. And I was debating in my own mind about whether I would continue college. Uh, was I in college for the right thing? Did I need time off? Uh, how would I pay for it? Where would I go? And that's when I got interested in the new, what was it called, the new all-volunteer army. The GI Bill was being discontinued because the military was in big transition from being a draft and um, conscription service to all volunteer. And they had new um, benefits and new programs to uh, entice people to volunteer and enlist. And so that's what you did? Yeah, I first enlisted in what they call the delayed entry program because I wanted to go in for computers and electronics, you know, new high tech, the, the newest things. And there was quite a waiting list for that. And I began to have doubts because I was doing well at Framingham State and working uh, full time as well. Uh, but living at home, which I didn't enjoy, so I was looking to travel, get out and go places. And when I enrolled in the delayed entry program so I could um, get the full GI Bill, I, um, there was just too long a wait. So I uh, reneged on the contract. Uh, opted out of that contract and I regretted it a few months later because in February of 77 um, I had been re-recruited by new recruiters who still had me on file and uh, they gave me the options of going to California or Hawaii if I would enter immediately and join the military police. So as long as I was willing to go into the military police immediately rather than taking advantage of the delayed entry program um, now the GI Bill that expired, they would not renew my delayed entry uh, contract for the GI Bill, but they had other options and so I opted to go in immediately. I didn't tell my family or friends anybody, it was kind of like my own big secret. I didn't discuss it with anybody, uh, it was my own idea, I wanted to do it on my own. And uh, the recruiters were very convincing and they just said, you know, someone who's six foot five and 230 pounds you know, I wasn't going to sit behind the desk pushing buttons that I should be on the street working. And so they, you know, convinced me to en enlist immediately, and I did. I just signed up and went in immediately. And what year was that? Uh, February of 1977. And you enlisted in what branch? Army. Army MP. Yes. Military police. Um, why do you think they asked you to join the military police? Um... Well, you know, because of the Vietnam stigma at the time, a lot of people weren't volunteering for the military. They were having problems recruiting people, and, you know, most, I guess, people just don't like the cops. Uh, as I mentioned, when I was young and hanging out with these veterans that were coming home from the Vietnam War, um, you know, people just didn't like the police either, but I always got along with the, like, I was a wild kid, but I was never a criminal, I was never trouble, you know, I wasn't a problem. And, um, my mother worked at Framingham Union Hospital for years in the emergency room, and my father managed local businesses. So, I mean, their involvement in the community, you know, I got to know a lot of police. The police knew my family, I knew the police, we were friends with them all. So I liked the police anyways, and I was fond of the veterans. And when uh, they said, well, you know, there's a waiting list for everything, but we need police right now, they, they had a, a shortage of you know, recruits for the military police and that's why they were willing to offer me good duty stations immediately. So what was the response of your family when reality set in that John was going off to the army? Shock, absolute shock. Uh, surprisingly my father was the most upset. Um, uh, you know my mother couldn't believe that I was dropping out of college but uh, she seemed to understand what I was doing and why. But they just thought it was like the worst decision and <laughs> that, I, that I was crazy. So did you have to do a basic training? Yeah. Where did you do that? Fort Jackson, South Carolina. 
Was that the first time you had been out of the Massachusetts area? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. What do you remember about that? Well, the first time out of New England, I, I went to school, as I said, in Maine. And my family vacationed regularly in Maine or in Cape Cod. You know, I'd never been, I'd been in New York City, uh, but that's about it, you know, stuck to New England. And what was Fort Jackson like? Uh, kind of another world altogether, because it was an old World War II um, base. So the barracks were, you know, World War II era, upgraded during the Korean conflict. There were new parts of the um, base. But uh, where I had basic training was an area called um, Tank Hill. Just basically the soil is just red clay, a lot of pine trees, and dusty, dry, hot. Uh, even, you know, I, I was there in, uh, I said when I in February, so I would have been at Fort Jackson in February and March uh, to the beginning of April at basic training. But I remember the days were very hot and um, nights were cold. Nights were cold, days were hot. And we were on Tank Hill because there was uh, all the barracks, you know, were lined, little boxes like lined up in rows and rows, you know, in dirt alleys. and. Did you receive any advanced or specialized training beyond basic, being well, an MP? Well, after, after you have basic training, then, uh, as I said, it was a new volunteer. You know, the Vietnam War was over, and the, the military was modernizing. And they have, they, the advanced training, they call it AIT, Advanced Individual Training. So whatever your specialty is going to be. If you're going to be an engineer, you go to a base where they have an engineering school. If you're going to be a medic, you know, they send you to a base that has medical school. I went to Fort McClellan, Alabama, outside of Anniston, Annabella, Alabama, and uh, Anniston's a beautiful old city. They're small, but beautiful old city, and Fort McClellan is just a gorgeous facility. Uh, I remember uh, the first time that we were allowed to go off base and go into town. Uh, I don't even remember how we got there. I don't know if we were in uh, some hitchhiking or just bummed a ride from somebody, or I don't think we got on a bus. But I remember getting a ride back to base, and when we were driven to the main gate, the uh, main gate is surrounded by sprawling lawn on both sides, and there are these uh, stucco, white painted wall, low walls uh, that rise up to a, like a symbolic archway. And there were just herds of deer, you know, big buck and some does and fawns just grazing in the grass and laying in the grass. And, you know, you're thinking of a, a police academy on a big military base, and here it is, Bambies, and, you know, it's like <laughs> napping at the front gate. So it was really stunning, beautiful facility. Did you have any friends from this area that you kind of hooked up with, or were you... No, was... no, it was really something that I planned on my own, yeah. debated on my own. I never discussed it with anybody. What was it like uh, being in this all-volunteer group where you were mixed in with Southerners and in a Southern climate. Was that difficult or? Yeah, it was difficult. Uh, and to elaborate on your question, the, at the time for the volunteer, the new volunteer army, uh, they had a program called the Buddy System where they would, and they, uh, the recruiters several times tried to convince me to get someone to go in with me that, you know, besides being able to just get one person at a time, you know, they can get two or three or a bunch of people to recruit if they'll get a, a guy and all his buddies to go in at the same time. And so they made it more enticing to say, use the buddy system because if you, if you enter the military with your friend, you can go to the same basic training, you go to the same AIT, uh, same specialty, you can choose the same bases to be stationed with together, the same units, so that you're not alone, that you are with someone. And um, I know I met a lot of guys from different parts of the country that did do that. But I wasn't interested in that. I was just something. And plus, you know, New England, and especially the Massachusetts, Boston area, is so liberal, you know, and anti-war and um, really anti-military. Whereas other parts of the country, like, say, Tennessee, the volunteer state, you know, Tennessee regularly has more volunteers that go in the military throughout our history than anywhere else in the nation. And that's why it's called the volunteer state. And most of Dixie, a lot of the South is uh, a very proud military culture. Uh, Did you fit in? Yeah, uh, fortunately, well, just like in high school and at prep school in Maine, uh, I was always very gregarious. Uh, I don't want to sound vain using the word charismatic, but I always met people very easily. I made friends very easily. 
um, one instant at the basic training. Uh, I remember that uh, because of my Boston accent, which isn't so prominent now, but it definitely was back then, uh, I learned very quickly. Uh, one thing they teach you, don't volunteer for anything. If they're looking for a volunteer, don't do it. And uh, it was only like in the first week or so that uh, the few people that did volunteer was that the company um, first sergeant, uh, the nickname for the first, every company has a company commander and a company first sergeant. They call them top, you know, that's the nickname for the top. So basic training every day, we'd go into formation in the morning and whatever exercises or drills we were going to be doing. And uh, there's always paperwork having to have to be handed back and forth and run up to the company office or another company or some facility or something. So I, I noticed that they were asking for a volunteer and they get a volunteer, they just have the volunteer run somewhere, grab some paper and they go running somewhere and hurry back. And we only got so many minutes. And I've been a runner all my life and I still am. You can see me running around Natick every day. And usually about this time of day, I'm running at least three to five miles all over Natick. And people I don't even know walk up to me and say, hey, I saw you running, you know, <laughs> where's your water bottles? You know, so people do see me around a lot and uh, introduce themselves. And so I've always been a runner. And uh, I noticed that these volunteers were being sent to go run somewhere. So I started volunteering immediately because I just couldn't stand standing there, you know, in formation. And I had the opportunity just, you know, to, you know, burn off some steam. So I just volunteered and I'll run. And, uh, I had no problem jumping fences, going over vehicles, under buildings, through buildings. I took whatever shortcut it was and just ran as fast as I could. And as I said, a lot of the military culture is very Southern, you know, very Dixie. And um, uh, so the top, the sergeant, uh, you know, is real Southern, real hardcore, gravelly, voice, loud, violent, obnoxious, crazy guy, but definitely very lovable. And uh, so I volunteered because I wanted to say, I wonder where they're running, you know. So he'd hand me a piece of paper and say, go run. And I was so fast and got back so quick, he was just stunned. And, uh, and he goes, oh, you're from Boston, aren't you? He goes, where would you learn to speak? Why don't you learn to speak right, you know. <laughs> and he said, you know, well, he, I, you don't, I don't want to be profane, but, you know, he used certain epitaphs, uh, you know, words to bleep out. Uh, Kennedy lover from Kennedy country. So that's what he started calling me. Where's Boston? Kennedy lover from Kennedy country. And so every morning before we go off, he needed someone to run somewhere to do something, pick up paper or deliver papers. He would just start looking around the company and go, where's that Kennedy lover from Kennedy country? Boston, get up here. Run. <laughs> yeah. So how long were you at Fort McClellan? A couple months. And during that time, did you start training to become an MP? Or? Yeah, um, that's well, that's uh, Fort McClellan is where the Military Police Academy is. And it was a brand new facility. They had built this massive, massive structure of numerous buildings and they called it the Puzzle Palace, it was a new name. Very uh, modernistic concrete and glass buildings on a huge, huge plaza. And, um, and it was mixed, all the services, Army, Air Force, Marines, all trained for military police training there together. And the uh, MP company I was in was Marines and Army. Excuse me. May I? Yes, you may. During that time, was there anything that stands out about some of your training that was either helpful later on or thinking back, you wonder why they did it that way or anything like that? Uh, well, as you asked earlier, to elaborate on your question about uh, multiculturalism in the military, uh, at basic training, we started off with uh, maybe a hundred guys in our company for basic training. And there were Native Americans from reservations out west. There were a lot of immigrants uh, looking to gain citizenship, you know, from South American countries, South Central American companies, uh, the Philippines, uh, uh, similar places. And, uh, you know, different, you know, minorities, uh, blacks from down south are very different than, say, the blacks from Chicago. In what way? Uh, culturalism, I mean, uh, our society is made up of so many diverse cultures and uh, their way of looking at things, you know, uh, such as like Boston and New York have such a fast pace of living. But like Chicago, which is such a huge, beautiful city, is much more down to earth and it 
even keel, you know, a, a, a more relaxed pace uh, like the Midwest. And down south, things are even much more uh, slow paced and easy going. Did you find with this multiculturalism that um, segregation or desegregation was a positive or a negative? Uh, I think desegregation was a big positive, and I think uh, the military is kind of a microcosm of what happens uh, in society at large. I think the military, uh, and especially the South, the Southerners are, were, are less, although, although segregation was such a big issue for the South, and then forced on places like South Boston, uh, you know, with the school bus um, era, and you know, and busing for, you know, mix, mixing the neighborhoods. Um, I, I think racism is, is more um, uh, extreme up north, you know, and in the cities than it was down south. I, saw, I, I found that the blacks from the south and the whites from the south got along much easier than, than urban or northern blacks and whites. Mm, interesting. And, um, and like I said, basic training, there was about 100 guys in our company. By the time basic training was over, half of them were gone. You know, they just didn't make it through basic training. And you know, when, when you did make it through basic training, then um, you went on to your AIT, Advanced Individual Training, whatever, you know, military base or school, and that's why I ended up at the MP Academy. How and, many were in your group there? <clears throat> um, it was pretty large. Um, you know, at least 100, maybe up to 300. It was pretty large. And, and you said you were there for a few months. Yeah, about, about two months. And at that time, I mean, with basic and with MP training, obviously training included firing arms, correct? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, a lot of that in basic training. Also. Um, once you finished at Fort McClellan, where did they send you? Fort Ord, California. And how do you spell that? O-R-D. O-R-D. D. And how long were you at Fort Ord? About a year. What was that like? Oh, that was great because Fort Ord, uh, and I, I believe the 7th in Infantry Division has been either dissolved or moved. I don't know exactly what has happened in the 7th Infantry Division. But Is that I believe, the division you were in? Yeah, at Fort Ord. That was their home base. Uh, uh, I think Fort Ord has actually been returned to the state of California. It's now a reserve or, you know, some... something like that because it's directly on Monterey Bay. I was just going to say if my memory serves me right, it's right on the water and just absolutely stunning. It is. It's incredible. It's central California at Monterey. What was it like out there? I mean, here you go from New England to the south and then over to the west coast. What, what was it like there? Well, my family has always been uh, oriented towards the water. Uh, my mother uh, family had land on the north shore that was uh, close to the beach although she grew up in Spencer, Mass, and my father grew up in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, on the ocean. So both my parents have always, you know, when we were kids, we always uh, went to the ocean. Actually, we lived in a place near Cleveland Circle in Brookline before moving to Natick on a road called Wilson Pond. It was this little goldfish pond in the middle of the cul-de-sac road. And then we moved to Lake Chichuit, and uh, Wilson Junior High School was on Wilson Pond. I went to a school in Maine, which is on Long Lake. Uh, every summer, my parents took us to either the Cape Cod for vacation or we went to the lakes in Maine. And uh, it just seems that every place in my whole life has been on a body of water. So even in the military? Yeah, so that which was great because uh, you know, I ended up on Monterey Bay. What was a, a day in the life of um, during that time? Well, Fort Ord was extremely large besides having you know, like 100,000 people there. Uh, it was a huge mass of the land, like the largest military base on, in, one of the largest in the country at the time, just a huge sprawling um, area of open land. And on base, uh, you know, it was a modern base with a lot of modern facilities. Uh, so it was like police work in a city, you know, it was um, a small city. And right outside was Monterey, which is a m moderate sized city in California. The, original first Spanish capital of California, and Monterey is just historic and beautiful. And also there's a small military base called Presidio Monterey on the Monterey Peninsula, and that's where the Defense Language Institute is, where I also did security details. As it was the MPs at Fort Ord who had to do security and details at Presidio Monterey for the Defense Language School, where when I was on security detail there, 
I met uh, defense intelligence uh, officers who recruited me to take tests for defense intelligence training, which I passed and was accepted into the school, the Defense Language Institute at the Presidio Monterey, which I was thrilled about because I wanted a long time military career. And I had no direction in life. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to go places and see things, you know, mm -hmm. and do stuff. What was, what was the testing like? Was it a written test? Yeah, uh, for, the, for the language school, mm -hmm. it was all in, intellectual stuff. Uh, a lot of um, pretty much like SAT exams, like college exams, things like that. And what, w what would the outcome be? To learn different languages? Is that what it was? Yeah, to it's be? still the same thing. It's, uh, they, you know, for listening posts, uh, basically the military listens to the airwaves that are all over the planet from all the countries and they, you know, tap into phone lines or whatever, you know, radio communications uh, to listen in on conversations try and pick up intelligence data. So they send cadets to the school to learn a specific language. And what did and you learn? I never attended the school. I ended up um, extending my enlistment because once I got accepted into the school, you know, you have to make a reservation and you get, you're on a waiting list and you get assigned to a specific language group. There are five major categories, all the languages in the world are reduced to five major categories. And then whatever category you're best in, they give you two or three options of what language you would like to learn that they're willing to have you mm -hmm. uh, participate in. And so uh, I did very well in all the tests, so I had pretty much open options. So I had to extend my enlistment an extra year and then re-enlist, and then I was going to be sent back to, to Presidio Monterey. But uh, after I got accepted, accepted into the school and extended my enlistment, I was required to put in a year of foreign service. So I was transferred to Italy. How did you feel about that, being transferred? Oh, I loved it. It was, it was thrilling. I mean, I had done so well uh, in so many areas. And, uh, and were you transferred as an MP? Yes. So this was your first time over to Europe? Yes. How did you get there? Oh, it was an interesting trip. Uh, I, had to, I brought my little trophy with me. We had a thing called the uh, Military Police Battalion Stakes, which was a big competition uh, between all the military police companies in the battalion. There were at least three military police companies. I was in the 7th MP company, which we were pretty much the grunts of the battalion because the 7th Infantry Division uh, imagery is foot soldiers and the 7th Division was the least mechanized of all the divisions in the U.S. Army. And they call them grunts because you know, you're carrying your guns in your backpack, you're just you know, marching along grunting, I guess. I don't know for sure. So that was our job was to stay with the infantry command. We were the security and police details for the infantry command. And wherever the infantry went, we went. The other MP companies like the 571st was assigned to the base specifically. You know, they weren't so much infantry or foot soldiers, they were full time police. And then there was a third MP company, maybe even a fourth one, I don't remember what, exactly what they were. But the seventh MP company were kind of the dogs of the battalion. Uh, we spent as much time out in the field as the infantry troops did in uh, infantry training. Which was great too to go camping in the desert for a month, you know, playing soldier. That was <laughs> that was another, some very interesting experiences there. Um, but how did you get uh, over there? That was my initial yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, well, this was part of it because the Seventh MP Company had never won this contest, and I guess there was a lot of gambling on the side about who was going to win. And I had done so well in so many different categories about testing and skill training and uh, all different kinds of skills and training and things and and everyone knew I was a runner because whenever I got, got off duty I mean we had to run you get up in the morning go to breakfast you run to breakfast you go take a break to go to lunch you run to lunch you get off of duty for the day you're gonna go to dinner you have to run to dinner so I mean it's pretty rigorous training every day when you're on duty but then when you're off duty and you're on your own time, the first thing I would do is just get into my running gear and go running. I'd just take off into the desert myself, you know, into the hills and just go running. And then one of my buddies says, what do you, what do, you do that for it every day? I said, I can't help it. I got to do it. I just, you know, it's something I've always done. 
And he goes, well, do you mind if I tag along? Can I, try, I want to try running with you. So then he started running with me. And then a couple other guys saw us go running every day. So they wanted to go. So I ended up having this, there's a dozen of us that would just go running every day. And, uh, and every, you know, so everyone was always talking about it, that all the running that we would do and how fast we all were. And uh, so the commanders uh, came up to me one day and said, you know, we got this big uh, competition coming up and it's eight skills tests and you have to stop. You have to sprint a mile, stop and either uh, dismantle a weapon, name all the parts, reassemble it and fire it in a specific amount of time, sprint a mile, do the next um, skills test, first aid or a different kind of weapon and then sprint a mile, and there were eight stations. You had to sprint all the way around this whole eight-mile course, stop and do a skills test, and then get to the end. And um, they all knew how fast I was and how much running I did. So uh, the commanders took me aside one day and said, look, uh, we're going to give you a little extra time off to do some continue your studies, and, uh, and, and you're running. And we want you to know that uh, we've, you know, we've never won this before, and we're going to bet a lot of money on you, so you have to win this for us. That had to be a little intimidating. So I said, well, uh, no, I was thrilled. I mean, anytime I was given a challenge, I was really thrilled. I like the attention, you know, and I like getting credit for doing a good job. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, a lot of other things happen as well, but I mean, that's one of the good things. So um, and they, they just asked me, do you think you can do it? Do you really think you can do it? And I said, yeah, yeah, definitely, you know. I'm fast. I can I can run. I can do the mileage. No problem. I can do this. I can pass all the skills tests. They said, "Well, we're going to bet a lot of money on you thinking you can do it." And I said, "Well, is there any incentive?" And they said, "Yeah, 30 days paid leave." <clears throat> so, uh, as it happens, my mother was at a going to a nursing convention in um, Hawaii. So my the, and my father was going with her. So my mother and father were going to this nursing convention in Hawaii around the same time as this um, big stakes, this big competition. So I wanted time off. So they told me that I would get the time off. They would get 30 days leave, you know, and a, a bonus if I won this thing. And I won it. So I got my 30 days leave and my parents, when they, the convention in Hawaii was over, came to California. And I took my vacation and we drove, I drove up the um, Monterey coast to San Francisco and met my parents there. And uh, we went to Sausalito and Sacramento and Russian River and toured all of Northern California and uh, Central California, or Inland California, uh, while well, on vacation. So it worked out great. That's great. And then after that, were you shipped over to and Italy? Then, and then very shortly after that, I got another 30 days leave because I had bought a car. And uh, they give you a thing when they when you when you're when you have to travel to a, a new assignment. Now, because I had extended my enlistment and I was required to do a, a year of foreign service before I could start school, I had to you know do all this traveling and make these dates and the appointments. So, and because I had bought a car and my port of call was Boston, which is considered my hometown, they gave me 30 days paid leave to drive my car from. Monterey, California to Boston. I drove from Monterey through Colorado down to Florida to meet my sister and then from Florida up the East Coast to Boston. But because I was going overseas, they also give you a thing called um, port of call which is you get 10 days to go across sea and then five days, um, I forget the term for the last five days, is like uh, entry or arrival time. So I got 45 days paid vacation which was driving all over. North America and then flying to Europe and uh, I had a few extra days and a few extra bucks so I landed in Italy as a tourist, <laughs> excuse me, as a civilian tourist. So that was quite a trip and quite an introduction to Italy. So that would have been in 76? 78. 78. So in 78 you arrive in Italy. What do you remember most? What strikes you about where you were in Italy when you first got there? Uh, it was right on the ocean again, the Ligurian Sea, which is part of the Mediterranean in central mm -hmm. Tuscany. Yeah. Right at the, um, right near the mouth of the Po River, which flows through Florence and Pisa. Uh, the big industrial port, military port uh, that we were near was called Livorno, and uh, a magnificent city. And we were just about 10 minutes uh, down the autostrada from Pisa and the famous Leaning Tower. And we're, we're Italy is a, kind of like California really in, in many ways. 
uh, without the suburbs. Because Italy, I think the Italians just do it better. You, they, you, your farms go right up to the city. You know, the cities are very compact. And I imagine Italy, like Germany and England, the rest of the modern world is mostly suburban living now anyways. But even back then in the, in the 70s, uh, people were either urban in the cities or rural. And the agriculture is phenomenal. So that the you know, farms just go right up to the edge of the city. There's no suburban sprawl like there is here. And um, uh, I just, the base where we were stationed at is a place called Camp Darby, and it's mostly underground. It's all underground storage bunkers for the Air Force and the Navy. So the, it's an Army base. And it's very small, but most of it's underground. The, the bunkers are in a section of the base that's uh, 20 square miles, four miles by five miles of pine forest. Uh, the huge, gorgeous, enormous pine trees, the pine cones are like bigger than my head. And they raise them for pine nuts, you know, pignolis, the pine nuts. Mm -hmm. So under contract, the preserve is managed by the Italians where they harvest the pine nuts every year. And they also use the area to breed wild deer for the national parks in the mountain forest. So it's just this 20 square miles of beautiful pine forest and deer herds and all the military facility bunkers are underground. Why were they underground? Because of previous wars and... Well, they were mostly arms, you know, mm -hmm. you know armaments, you know, for the Air Force and, and the Navy. So what, when you had to go and report there, what was a typical day like at Camp Darby for you? Uh, when I first got there, well, I had, uh, I, I, I think I was kind of smart about it because when I, I knew I was going to be going to language school and I knew I was going to Italy so I bought a bunch of the, you know, the famous Berlitz language tapes and I have Italian cousins that lived in Boston and their relatives you know, had spoke Italian and I guess you could call me an Italophile because I really loved everything Italian. You know, who doesn't love Italian food? <laughs> right. So what I did is I knew that I'd be driving cross country and I could just put the tapes in my tape deck and just start learning it, speak Italian while I was driving cross country so that I could speak enough Italian to stay out of trouble when I got there, you know? Of course, I didn't realize that when I got to Italy, everyone spoke English. <laughs> but I insisted and what, I think what, a lot of what was good for me was a lot of Italians befriended me because I insisted on speaking Italian. You know, they said, no, we speak English, we speak English. I said, uh, when in Rome, do what the Romans do, right? I'm in Italy, I want to speak Italian. So uh, they appreciated that and they helped me out with that a lot. At this point at Camp Darby, what was your rank? Uh, PFC. Well, actually, no, PFC is E3. I was E4 by then. I was called Specialist. Specialist prior, fourth class. You know, uh, yeah, Spec 4. So, um, but I got to Italy a little early as a civilian, Alex. I got 45 days vacation, so I, you know, I didn't shave, I didn't cut my hair. I arrived looking like a civilian hippie tourist, and I had a few days off before I had to report for duty. So I went into the village, you know, met the locals. I met some of the girls there. Got a new girlfriend right away, uh, who was just a wonderful person. Introduced me to her best friend, and her best friend ended up becoming my wife. Really? Yeah. But it was a tough time in Italy because communism was very popular. The communists were winning all the elections in all the major cities and provinces. There was a lot of violence. The Red Brigade were blowing up everything. Do you remember seeing part of that? or were Yeah. You oh, yeah. The, uh, the president of Italy at the time, Aldo Maro, had been kidnapped and held hostage for a week, and he was murdered. And they found his body in the trunk of a car a week later. So, I mean, can you imagine finding, from finding George W. Bush in the trunk of a car? So I know a lot of people would like to put him in the trunk of a car. But, uh, I mean, it was just a horrific time in Italy. But even under those circumstances, I think even the communists revered the Americans because they know what the Americans had done to Italy during World War II to get rid of the fascists and evict the Nazis and win the war. You know, basically, America is an Italian country. We were founded by an American, named, um, America was founded by an Italian, named after an Italian. Our favorite food is Italian. There's so much stuff about America that is Italian, mm -hmm. you know, and Roman. I mean, everything that's red brick, that's a Roman invention. Red bricks are a Roman invention, so. So, talk about a typical day. Uh, well, the Italians really did, do have a fondness for the Americans. It's a, it's a very special relationship. But I think the political crisis uh, in Italy at the time made things kind of tense. Mm -hmm. you know, um, Were you constantly, uh, and I don't mean 
you were on guard, but I mean, were you constantly physically on guard also about well, your were, surroundings? there were two parts of the base. There was, like I said, the bunkers, mm -hmm. which uh, was under the reserve, uh, which, you know, we would be in infantry uniforms, you know, fatigues mm -hmm. to do security in that part of the base. But then we'd have to be in dress uniforms with the fancy white hats and the fancy everything else when we were on the headquarters command part of the base, which you know was kind of, was closed but open to the public generally. It's pretty much an open base, so there was two types of duty. There was police duty for uh, the command area and the headquarters area, and then there was uh, like not a combat is the in incorrect word to use, but there was infantry duty and fatigues and did security in the um, depot area. Does anything stand out in your mind back then about an incident or anything that you found? Well, I, I, don't, I don't want to get into anything personal, mm -hmm. but um, it was a tough time. Uh, one thing, uh, fortunately for me, uh, I did get married while I was over there to a military police woman. We were both military police. She was from Massachusetts. Uh, her father was a policeman in Massachusetts who had died recently at that time uh, of cancer. Uh, her mother was diagnosed with cancer. Her sister was being operated for breast cancer. So her family was having a lot of problems w with that. And she ended up having to, to leave to go home because of all that. But This was uh, after you were married. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But one thing that, um, there, the, like the military, because it was a new volunteer army, and because of the political crisis in Italy, it was a very strained situation for everybody. And because I was new, and uh, I had uh, a top secret clearance because I had been accepted in defense intelligence and was going to be going to intelligence school. And people were very suspicious of me. It's like, who's this guy and what's he doing here? Mm -hmm. you know? And there were already a lot of problems on the base before I had arrived. And if I hadn't met my future wife and if she had not befriended me, I probably wouldn't have had very many friends. Mm -hmm. But she was extremely popular. She was quite a gal, wonderful woman. And... Uh, I only met friends through her, and most of my friends became, were the medics. You know, there's a military hospital for the region, you know, not just for the base, but the military hospital there served, served a large region, large area. So besides being an, an arms depot, it was also a hospital base. And uh, so a lot of her friends were medics, so they befriended me as well because I was her friend, and then when she and I were married, we had our own apartment in the village. and. Um, I actually rented another place as well. I, I shared a house with three medics that I rented with them, as well as sh sharing the apartment with my wife. Now, why did you do that? Uh, <laughs> a, a number of reasons, uh, crazy reasons. At the time, it thought it was a good thing to do. Well, it was because um, uh, with the problems with her family and so many of our friends constantly coming to the apartment, uh, she, it, was just, it was just too much. You know, we were overwhelmed with friends, we were overwhelmed with the partying, we were overwhelmed by her friends' problems, my friends' issues. So me and one of my buddies and two of the nurses, his girlfriend and another girl, they were looking for someone to share this four-bedroom house with. And to get people to stop coming to our apartment, I said, well, great, I'll rent, I'll share it with you. I will, you know, share that house, I'll rent one of the rooms, and so that all the partying will be there and just stay out of my wife's apartment. You know, she doesn't want people coming over here anymore. She's got enough problems, there's enough going on. Let's keep the people away from my apartment. Everyone can go party at the house. I'll help pay the rent. I'll, I'll rent one of the rooms. I'll be a partner in the house and they, everyone can go over there and stop coming to her apartment. And did that happen? Yeah. Good. Yeah, it pretty much worked, worked, worked out that way. But um, there was a lot of violence, a lot of chaos. And one thing that I really disturbed me was that she wanted to get out of the military. She wanted to avoid her contract. And at the time, I was studying what they call the Uniform Code of Military Justice to understand military law and military contracts. And because of her father's death, her mother's illness, her sister's problems, she wanted to go home, and they wouldn't let her go. So I just happened to know some loopholes and the right documents to fill and the right kind of help to get so that she could go. So I helped her get her contract voided. and for her to go home. And one thing that a lot of guys did because of the problems in Italy and the political chaos and, and the stress, um, there was no mandatory drug testing back then. And there was a lot of drugs in the military, even in the military police, a lot of drug abuse. Uh, 
-hmm. a lot of scandal, a lot of crime. And uh, what guys would do, even those guys that weren't drug addicts, would go and do heroin and then go to the hospital and say, I need to be drug tested. I, I'm, I think I'm on drugs. I think I'm a drug addict. I need to be drug tested. And if they test positive for heroin, they're immediately discharged. You know, dishonorable discharge. It was, so, it was such a difficult job under such a stressful time that, uh, you know, guys that were smart, good soldiers, you know, everything in the world going for them. And they would just start doing heroin so that they could just go to the hospital and say, you know, um, I think I might be a drug addict. I need to be drug tested. And as soon as they test positive, you know, they didn't care about their benefits. They didn't care about the GI Bill, their record. They you know, just they, wanted to get out. They just wanted to get out fast. So this was stressful on you as an MP yeah, because you had to get involved in... Well, I, I didn't have to get involved on that level. It just was so disturbing mm -hmm. that, you know, people that I loved and cared for... So these were was, friends, it, some yeah, of them, I that mean, were doing people this. people I worked with. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when you, know, you carry guns around every day for a living and you, you're under a stressful job, um, and to see people just ruin their lives. So what happened is... It wasn't just that they say, oh, I'll do heroin once and test positive and get out. They started doing it every day. Because so you're working with people who are carrying guns that are on heroin because they want out. Mm -hmm. You know, and the whole, I mean, even the commander of the base was relieved of duty because he was doing such a poor job. And um, it was just utter, total chaos. It was just so much that was going on that was so difficult. And I didn't want her being involved with those people. It's like, these are your friends, but, you know, we can't have them around here. Right. You know, it's not a good thing. And... Pretty much the, med the medics, uh, you know, didn't have the stress that the MPs did. So all of our friends that were medics were not into that. You know, right. they weren't trying to get out. Right. And those that were trying to get out were causing a lot of problems for everybody else. So your wife did get out. Yeah, legally, safely. And was that difficult for you then? Because you know, I didn't think it would be, mm -hmm. but it was. I mean, the day after she left, I just went to pieces. It was I was mm -hmm. a mess. Mm -hmm. I just total nervous breakdown, just total absolute breakdown. So you actually did have a breakdown. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it was quite dramatic. And um, what happened then? Dramatic. What did they do for you? Uh, well. They, um, I mean, I was a good soldier, you know, I was a, a, a good troop, um, I had a great reputation, and, you know, I had a lot of friends, I had a lot of support, but there was just so much, there was so many, there was so many other things that happened that were just so bad, and, and not just in Italy, but uh, the year before in California, a lot of terrible things happened, uh, a, lot of, a lot of bad things. Uh, Can you share any of them with no, us? No, no, I don't want to get into anything personal. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just too difficult. I mm -hmm. actually, uh, it's one thing I love about the VA today is that uh, when I finally did get out of the Army, uh, I can remember coming home and, you know, hooking up with all my old friends and moving to Framingham, you know, to be near my family, get, you know, re get started over in life. And uh, while living in Framingham, you know, I hooked up with all my old friends from Natick and we'd go out to clubs and stuff and my buddies say, Hey, he's a veteran. He just got out of the army. I say, don't tell people that. I don't want mm -hmm. anyone to know. Just, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I'm not a veteran. I didn't just, just please, you know, just drop it. So whenever anyone would ask me, are you a veteran? Are you in the army? I would say, no, I'd just deny it. I, so, so I could avoid talking about it. But let's get back to that piece a bit while you're still in Italy and your wife left. And that had to be so stressful. You were under stress anyway. And so you had a breakdown. Did you go to a military hospital? No, the, military, the hospital was right, right there. Right there. Yeah. And did you stay there for any length of time, or did they? No, no, I didn't. I, I stayed on duty. Um, I had a lot of support, and uh, you know, my commanders they didn't want me to um, quit. I wanted. I, uh, you know, she, <clears throat> I struggled for a few weeks um, after she. I, I had no idea how how I'd be affected. It was just uh, very traumatic, and. Uh, and I was drinking a lot, you know, I, I didn't get involved in drugs mm -hmm. uh, because there were so many issues with that already that I, you know, I'd made a stand against that. Yeah. But I did start drinking a lot and got into a lot of fights and had a lot of problems because of that. So what was it like for an MP to get into fights? A regular occurrence, <laughs> part of the territory. I mean, that's one thing that uh, made me popular was I was such a good fighter. So. How long did you stay in Italy after your wife came back? Uh, well, she came back to the States, and uh, she was here um, for a few months. And uh, I, moved back, I moved into her apartment full-time on my own without her. And coincidentally, 
I had a younger sister who was like four or five years younger than me, who I knew her best friend, so that they grew up in Natick uh, on the same street and in Framingham. And they were touring Italy. So these two girls, uh, you know, that were, to, were to me like, were like little sisters, moved in with me. So they were staying and I gave them our bedroom and I was sleeping on the couch and they were staying in my bedroom and to surprise me, my wife shows up without telling me. And so she comes in at two o'clock in the morning and to wake me up to find two young girls living in her bedroom and that kind of flipped her out. She just didn't understand. It was hard to explain. Yeah, well, 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 actually, it wasn't hard to explain. These are my sister's best friends. They are from my hometown, and they came, they showed up. They just showed up at the door. I didn't know they were coming. Sure. They just showed up at my door and said, hey, you know, yeah, your sister gave us your address and told us to come by that you would put us up. And so I said, no, well, that's a coincidence. My wife is in Massachusetts. You can have her room. I'll sleep on the couch in the living room. And, um, you know, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, to surprise me, she just shows up and things continue to go downhill after that. That's a shame. After that period of time, now when she showed up, she was out of the military at yeah. that point. Um, did you then come home or did you stay on for any length no, of time? No, we tried to work things out, but uh, just so much had happened and transpired. So much had gone wrong and there were so many problems that... Um, we decided to um, separate and that she would come back to Massachusetts and I would try and get a discharge from the Army and end my career and um, we'd get a divorce when I get back to the States. And is that what happened? Yep. So did you get the discharge from Italy or did you have to come back here first? Um, the, they arranged my discharge in while well, I was still in Italy. The new post commander, uh, you know, they, like I said, they did everything they could to try and keep me, you know, because um, I, I had an excellent record. I had my reservation at the Language Institute at the Presidio Monterey. I had already re-enlisted after extending my initial enlistment. Yeah. I had everything going for me, but I really, by that time, I had been through so much. Uh, there had been a lot of violence, um, you know, some terrible, unspeakable crimes, a lot of bad things that happened in California that I tried to get away from. Now, were uh, they came on, back up again in Italy? Were they on on site crimes or yeah. Oh, yeah. within yeah. the barracks themselves? Yeah, the barracks mm -hmm. and other parts of the military base. A lot mm -hmm. of, like I said, the military then uh, was in such extreme transition that a lot of it was just chaos. Mm -hmm. um, so, but with everything that had happened in Italy, uh, un compounded and on top of what, what happened in California the previous year, that it was just more than I could, you know, mentally, emotionally deal with. Mm -hmm. So, um, did you get a medical discharge, or did you get a? Um, no, I got an honorable, honorable discharge. Mm -hmm. um, the commander, uh, the new commander, was was a very wonderful man, very understanding. I was very fortunate. I was mm -hmm. very fortunate uh, throughout my military career. I, I kind of laugh every time I think of my company commander at the 7th MP Company in California because his name was Captain Rock, <laughs> you know, kind of like a comic book hero kind of guy. You know, you think of Captain Rock, it can't be a real name, but that was his name, Captain Rock, and he was a wonderful, wonderful man, uh, incredible guy to, to, to everybody, and so was the first sergeant, top. Uh, I was very fortunate with most of my commanders. Uh, there were a couple of bad apples that, you know, made life miserable. Um, you know, but they kind of weed them out eventually. But the, the army, especially all the military, and especially, you know, the military police is a way of just covering things up. They like to just cover things up, you know, like to hide things and cover things up and, um, you know, kind of play shell games, the way they move things around and cover things up. And, uh, so you came home, you got a military discharge. Did you come back to Natick? Framingham. You came back to Framingham. Well, I came back to Natick to visit, but I had no intention of staying. Uh, but I was very fortunate that I had friends that were property owners in Framingham, and they gave me a house to live in. And did you go back to work or to school? So I, um, uh, because I was just out of the military with an honorable discharge, Massachusetts under Governor Dukakis had a special program where they would do uh, finance, high-tech training, any high-tech skills, anything in technology. So because I got my military discharge, I was collecting unemployment. Excuse me. Excuse me again. Burping in the microphone. I'm like, can you edit that? <laughs> it's fine. 
Keep so it was forgetting it's on here. I'm talking into the camera, thinking that there's a loudspeaker over there, a microphone over there. Um, so I was very fortunate that I was um, collecting unemployment. Uh, when you get your discharge papers, when uh, there's a whole package you have to do. You return home, you report to a veterans rep, you report to the unemployment office as a veteran. They give you another veterans rep there, and. Uh, and Massachusetts was probably uh, more progressive than most of the states because of uh, the, the high-tech industry, the colleges, the education, the politics of the state. So I immediately went to school for a year full-time as a um, to training as a computer electronics test technician and systems operator. And it was at a building called the, um, uh, a school building that was converted to uh, the Marlboro Skills Training Center, I believe it was called. In Marlboro, Mass. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I was living in North Framingham, right on the Sudbury Line, which was easy access to Route 20 to get to Marlboro. So I was living in a beautiful home, in a beautiful neighborhood right there in North Framingham, commuting to school in Marlboro. And, uh, and I went to school for a year, and then I got a job with a company called Data Troll as a computer test technician uh, at Data Troll in Hudson. Now, when we were setting this appointment up, you mentioned that you also wanted to talk about the help that the VA has given you. Do you want to talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure, uh, and that's a recent thing. Um, like I said, because of my problems in the, in, the, in the Army, I didn't want to, it was just easier not to talk about it, just pretend that I never did it. And uh, so I just kind of, you know, um, just went into denial about it and uh, it was just easier that way. But when I got out of the military, even though I was, had a nice place to live, a good, good support system, school, a job, I got heavily involved with drugs, hard drugs. When you was, came home. Yeah, which is mm -hmm. ironic because I was so against drugs while I was in the military mm -hmm. that the first thing I did as soon as I got out of the Army was got involved in hard drugs right away and did a lot of drugs every day for three years of my life while going through school, while working, and then I couldn't keep a job, and after three years of that, I just um, actually went into rehab. I went to a hospital in Vermont. And did the military help you? Did no, no, what I did is um, I was encouraged by my unemployment rep when I first got out of the um, Army to apply for VA benefits and assistance, and I just refused. I said, you know, I don't need it, I don't want it, I'm not gonna get involved. You know, I'd rather just forget about the whole thing. Now, I went through divorce. Um, I had my educational benefits from the state of Massachusetts, which was separate from the VA and all of that. Uh, I had collected my unemployment. Um, I had plenty of money from my family and, and friends. So, you know, I just said, you know, I don't, I don't need it. I don't want it. I'd rather just not be involved. I'd rather just forget about it. And that's pretty much the way I lived for 20 years. But and how long were you in rehab in Vermont? A month. And that helped? Yeah. As a matter of fact, the place still exists. Uh, it's called Maple Leaf Farm in Underhill, Vermont. I highly recommend it to anybody for any kind of rehab. As a matter of fact, uh, while, in, while in Vermont uh, two years ago, I, a friend of mine that uh, was having problems, I convinced him to go up there. Yeah. I actually drove him to the place. So having lost your initial job at, you said, Data Troll, is mm -hmm. that right? Um, and then you kind of cleaned up your act. Yeah. And did you go back to work then? Um, I, I traveled uh, a little bit, and I ended up uh, going um, uh, down to Florida with friends from school. I was friends that I went to school in Maine with, that, you know, that I met at school in Maine, uh, we had ke I'd kept in touch with. And I ended up living in Florida, uh, Claywater Beach, for about two years. But ever since, you know, ever since then, uh, I mean, ever since I got out of the military, I never really kept a, a job for about three months is about the most I ever kept a job. Mm -hmm. uh, I just job hopped and moved constantly for 20 years. 20 years of my life I lived like that. And um, I got into, when I got to Florida, I started with Hilton Hotels doing seasonal employment, uh, which fit my condition and my lifestyle because I'd go to Florida for three months and work and then travel for three months and go to like New Hampshire and work for three months, come back to the Natick area, work somewhere for three months, take off to Arizona, Cape Cod, Maine, Virginia, I just constantly kept traveling, changing jobs and 
change. Were you a free spirit? Always, yeah. I mean, even as a child. I mean, it's just my nature. Now, you had mentioned that you didn't want it known that you were in the service. You didn't want anything to do with veterans um, benefits or anything. What changed your mind? Uh, for pretty much 20 years, uh, I worked in what was seasonal hospitality industry, you know, going south in the winter, north in the summer, odd jobs in between, spring and fall, constantly traveling, moving around. You know, that way there were no commitments, uh, mm -hmm. no long-term commitments, no ties, you know, uh, no stability, which, because uh, I had become very unstable, but I could commit for a few months, you know, move someplace new, meet new people, stick around for a few months, and then quit and move on. And that was my lifestyle for 20 years. And then what had happened is I came back to Natick. And I had left a job in uh, Delaware and moved in with friends in Richmond, Virginia. And I was only in Richmond for like three months. And I went down to Florida. And I was in Florida like a month and came back to Natick. And I was collecting unemployment from the state of Delaware through the Virgin, Richmond, Virginia office with a Florida driver's license, getting my checks mailed to my parents' address at Natick. Natick Mass so that they could forward them to me because the checks come every two weeks. So basically, you know, from a job in Delaware, filed at an office in Virginia with my Florida IDs being mailed to Massachusetts, sent up all the red flags. And because when I had first been discharged from the military 20 years earlier, I had, you know, filed for unemployment in Massachusetts as a veteran. You know, I took my papers in, did what I was told, you know, tried to straighten my life out, get back on track. So I was in the system as a veteran in Massachusetts. So a wonderful man, Rick Dumas, I believe he's still with Unemployment and Training Office down in Milford now. I'm not sure. I. Whenever I get involved in unemployment offices, I always ask, gee, is Rick Dumas still around? <laughs> I always look for the same people because a wonderful, wonderful man. And what he had done uh, is that he looked at my record and he just said, you know, this is, there's something wrong here. You know, you know, I have to research this. He goes, you originally filed for unemployment 20 years ago as a veteran. And now all these other unemployment applications, you're applying as a non-veteran. You know, why is that? He goes, we know you as a veteran. Everywhere else, you registered as a non-veteran. And he says, we have here enough file. We've been looking for you for 20 years. You know, you're entitled to benefits and programs uh, that you refuse to apply for. And I have to, he goes, we're doing an outreach program to find out why veterans are refusing assistance. It's there. And he goes, you know, why were you working in, the, in Delaware? Why did you file in Virginia? How did you end up with Florida ID? Why are the checks being mailed to Natick when you don't live there? You know, what is going on? So he goes, well, uh, do you mind talking to me some more? And he had called several times to my parents' home and other phone numbers that I left trying to reach me. Was he with the unemployment office? Or? Yeah. Okay. He was a veteran's rep. He's so a veteran he himself. Took, and he took, a, he took an interest yeah. in you. So he was, um, when I was doing this research as to why, you know, if, you know, if I had for, tw why for 20 years would I deny being a veteran and refuse mm -hmm. all these benefits and programs. So um, uh, he's a great man, convinced me to apply for some programs and from some, for some help. And I ended up living at the New England Shelter for Homeless Veterans in Boston on Court Street, which is a magnificent facility with wonderful people. And uh, they got me some new job training. and. Um, got me in a program and got me my benefits and when I was done with the program there which is four months which is a little bit longer than my average mm -hmm. and uh, when I completed that program I moved to Vermont and that was in 2000 and I stayed in Vermont for six years and um, which was back. a huge commitment for you well yeah I stayed in Vermont but I travel I didn't keep any job for more than three months I I moved all over Vermont my mm -hmm. my con my reason to go to Vermont was to become an artist that I was, uh, mall, um, Vermont has some of the world's best marble. It's the same quality and, uh, and, uh, and same reputation as Carrara marble from Carrara, Italy. Mm -hmm. And having, always, having wanted to always be an artist, I had the opportunity. I met people in Boston that owned old historic property that they wanted to restore in Vermont. 
And so I moved to, to this old farmhouse to renovate it and restore it to be as a small country inn that I would operate as an inn and have an art studio there that I could uh, restore the property for them, open it up, and do my art. And of course that didn't work out, but I used it as a base in the Brattleboro area, and then I started moving all over Vermont. I job hopped all over Vermont. And now? Still doing the same thing. <laughs> I haven't changed. But you do utilize the veterans' benefits Oh, now. yeah. The VA is magnificent. Um, when I got to the New England shelter, um, I got into the VA system, healthcare system. Uh, I got a psychiatrist who I'm still with. I've been with the same psychiatrist now for eight years. I'm no longer on medication, but I did use medications for seven years. Um, experimented with many, with, with several, I, I, I had several psychiatrists in many different organizations and hospitals, but never with the VA. And I think the VA has the best because they um, gave me quite a bit of st stability and um, uh, a lot of support. And um, I have a great therapist, there's a new VA clinic, small outpatient clinic in Framingham. Which is very convenient. Yeah, and I have a therapist there that I see every week or every other week. And, um, do they have a diagnosis for you? Yeah. Do you care to share it? It's a mixed diagnosis. It's, um, it's very complicated, and I'm not a psychiatrist myself, but uh, it's a multiple diagnosis of mixed things. And, uh, but it's a great, I mean, it's a, I've had a great deal of success. I've become very stable um, for me. Uh, I've stuck with the program, uh, and even though I was in Vermont, I still stuck with the same psychiatrist in Boston who monitored my care and the programs that I got involved with in Vermont. White River Junction uh, has a great VA facility and other clinics in the but Vermont is so rural and remote, it's tough to get around. But I did, uh, when I started at the shelter in Boston, uh, the Boston VA is just magnificent. And um, they really gave me hope. You know, they gave me the opportunity to start my life over and address my problems and address the issues uh, that I have. And um, do you ever speak to other veterans? Because you you seem very comfortable talking to us about it. Do you well, speak eight years to of other therapy works? <laughs> yeah. But do you speak to other veterans about yeah, utilizing yeah. those services that you well, shunned for so many well, years? you know, it's interesting. I've just been approved uh, this past month for VA vocational rehabilitation benefits, which would be two years of school. I just have to find a safe, stable place to live so I can go to school. I have to figure out where I'm going to live and go to school. That's my big um, job right now. And the vocational counselor, that I just met in Boston had a similar experience to mine and he went through vocational training and he became a vocational counselor excuse me again through vocational training and I always thought that you know I don't want to be involved with the military anymore I don't want to be involved with the VA it took them 20 years to find me and recruit me and get me into the VA but now after what is almost eight years of psychotherapy uh, and treatment um, there's no such thing as a cure, mm -hmm. but uh, I do feel, um, you know, kind of rehabbed. And what I really want to do now is uh, I, I look at so many of these guys coming back from Iraq and other parts of, uh, of the world and the stuff, Afghanistan and what's happening in the news. And it's not just the war zones, it's the military worldwide. And I, I really want to settle down, become stable and permanently employed so I can start giving back to the VA. So do you think going through this training, you may become a future counselor? I, I don't think I, I have the um, confidence or the capabilities to be a vo vocational rehabilitation counselor like the guy that I'm seeing now. But some kind of volunteer. I mean, they, the VA needs volunteers for everything, whether it's just driving people, you know, joining the American Legion and driving people as a volunteer, uh, visiting people in their homes, helping them get to jobs. Uh, going to the hospitals and pushing people around in wheelchairs. So uh, you see yourself doing that? Yeah. Um, uh, one thing that I was doing uh, when I'd come back to the area was as a volunteer to shut-ins. And it just happens that uh, I was visiting the quadriplegic in Boston once a month. 
just one hour a month, just go and sit with this guy so he has someone to talk to and so that his live-in home health aide can get some time off. And it was just amazing that that one hour was just so rewarding to that quadriplegic. And Was it also rewarding to you? I, it, yes, very much so, but I didn't realize it, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't even remember exactly how I got recruited into doing it, but I just said, well, I, you know, I got an hour, I'm going to do it. And it had nothing to do with the VA at the time or veterans. But it was at that time that, like I said, Rick Dumas, the veterans rep at unemployment, had got me involved in the VA and the programs at the shelter in Boston. So I ended up moving in with that quadriplegic and being his live-in care provider while going uh, to uh, chef certification training at the facility on Court Street. Working the facility, I worked in the kitchen full time doing breakfast and lunch. And uh, as school, so we basically had school in the morning and then lunch, serving lunch and dinner. And then, but we, the apartment uh, where this quadriplegic lived was just a few blocks away from the Court Street facility. So I was able to live with him, get VNA to come in and start caring for him, get home health aids full time. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to do his care 24 hours. Mm -hmm. We had a volunteer um, filling in for his original home health aide mm -hmm. who had um, left. He went into the hospital and died. He never came back. That's how I ended up living there. But his partner, helped me, and then we got the VNA in there, got the home health days in there, and I did that for four months while in training and working at the shelter. So I worked full-time at the shelter, went to school full-time, took care of the quadriplegic full-time, mm -hmm. and after four months of that, I was just exhausted. So when I had that opportunity to go to Vermont you did. and be alone, it was like, Phew, Sure, sure. So you have received and accepted, finally, benefits yes. from the VA. Yes. Did you join any you mentioned the American Legion. Did you join any veterans organizations? Well, the, the American Legion is specifically for um, combat um, duty people, people that were in the military during uh, skirmishes or you know uh, encounters like that. And being that I was what you call a Cold War warrior, in which was peacetime, I'm not really eligible for the American Legion, but mm -hmm. I have been involved with them because they've been very good to me. They've helped me tremendously. Uh, so you're involved, but not an official member. member. I am now a member of the AMBETS in Natick, because I'm here in Natick, and mm -hmm. there was other veterans in Natick, like Dave Jocelyn, mm -hmm. um, uh, who got me involved uh, with different veterans groups. And um, I've kind of like come out of my shell. I have the eggshell. The shell is broken, and you know I've, I've hatched, and I'm, I deal with the issues and the things that have happened in the past. It really was a long, long time ago. And the, the VA has evolved uh, and improved tremendously. And uh, uh, like I said, you know, I'd be dead. I'd be dead. You know, I was suicidal for a while, and I, I'd be dead if it wasn't for the VA. And uh, anyone that's um, eligible for benefits should, should just do it. Because there's so many people there that do want to help. And these people from that are coming back from Iraq are going to need it. And the VA, you know, is, is, is a, tight budget, they're strapped, they need volunteers. So if I, you know, if I go through this vocational training program uh, and have an income and a home of my own that I'm stable enough, I just can't wait to start volunteering. Helping. So you're giving back what they've given you. Yeah, specifically the VA, yeah. Did you attend any, any reunions from your old group or did you sort of pull all that aside? Uh, well, it just happens that um, a lot of the people that were at that small facility uh, in Italy ended up at Fort Devens and they looked me up and it just happens that my first girlfriend in Italy that introduced me to her best friend who ended up becoming my wife um, I bumped into her sister uh, in the Fort Devens area and she goes oh I can't believe it she goes give me your phone number give me your address so my sister's coming home and so I hooked up with that whole family and uh, that were stationed over there. They were uh, basically army brats. Their father was a commander in the hospital had made general and was stationed at Fort Devon. So I reunited with that whole family. And then all of our extended network of friends that were stationed there in the military that ended up at Fort Devon's, we all kind of hooked up. But it was more than I could bear. I just kind of slowly, uh, and all my drug addiction, I mean, I was involved in a lot of hard drugs and a lot of uh, drug use. And, uh, Have you ever spoken in the classroom to kids about that, or you, you're not quite ready to do that yet? 
Um, or do, no, do you ever think I that might be no, helpful? I yeah. never, <laughs> never thought of that. I, don't think, I never thought of myself as being a good example for kids. Well, I mean, being that you've obviously sought help and it has helped you. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I kind of um, sought help the exact same way that I went into the military. I did it privately and secretly on my own. Mm -hmm. Didn't tell anyone what I was doing until the last minute. It's like, okay, I'm doing this. I saved up enough money. I'm paying for it. I'm going. Mm -hmm. How important, given that for 20 years you were sort of in denial that you were in the service, how important now, looking back, do you feel being in the military was in your life? Uh, it was definitely the single most important thing I ever did in my life, uh, almost as important. Actually, more important than going to Princeton Academy. Uh, I, I had a difficult life and a troubled childhood, and uh, I had a lot of problems in the Natick schools, and it wasn't because of the schools. Natick has you know, magnificent schools. Um, do do just, you feel it was some of the issues that as an adult you're addressing? Yes, okay. good question, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, if it wasn't for the VA and the therapy and psychotherapy that I get there, I would not be able to mention this. I wouldn't sure. be able to talk about it. Sure. Um, but I had problems at, at school and at home, and I excelled at Bridgeton Academy. You know, Bridgeton Academy is an all-boys private school in remote rural Maine in the shadow of Mount Washington. And um, it's a magnificent school. It's a very unique um, prep school because it's, kind of, it's a postgraduate program. It's basically a jock school for athletes who are tremendous athletes that do not do so well academically. And so that they can get into better colleges than what they're being offered. Right. They go into Bridgeton Academy to get a postgraduate diploma. It's very much like a small college and it has a magnificent sports program as well as excelling in academics. And you know, I had a 4.0 average. Uh, I did extremely well at Bridgeton Academy. And uh, going to Bridgeton Academy was similar to going to the military. And, and uh, what was the question exactly? <laughs> too much. <laughs> well, you said that um, that going into the service was the single most important thing in your life, but also Bridgeton, and that's yeah. how you brought up Bridgeton. Yeah. As we finish this fascinating interview, is there anything, a thought or a comment that you'd like to make that you either want to share with your family or with others who are definitely going to be seeing this tape? I think it's good to encourage anyone that has an interest into the military, any branch, Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, National Guard, Coast Guard, uh, anything should go, especially before college, that uh, getting out of high school, uh, you know, getting out of school uh, and moving on to college, uh, there should be some kind of transition. That now maybe for a lot of people, college isn't even really necessary. That, you know, going to college is a huge expense that so many people go to college and they never work in the field that they have a degree for. They, they, they never have a life that has any much to do with what they did in college or why they went to college. But everyone that goes to the military takes home with them something that uh, will never leave them, that will benefit them later in life, definitely. I've heard others say it's built my character in many ways and uh, or helped me become independent or... Um, yeah, the first response I have in my mind is it, it made me a man. I became a man when I went into the military. Uh, you know, I, I did well in college and enjoyed it and loved it, but it was such a party atmosphere. You know, you go, you go from high school, you get out of high school, you want to party, and the party just continues in college for so many people. And student loans are, are not a good deal. There's so many problems with that program that uh, this, it's so easy to pay for education when, when, when you get those benefits from the military. And a lot of people that go into the military for the education benefits end up staying in the military because you can go to school and get an education while you're in the army or, or any, any, any branch of the service. And I think it really makes a person mature. I think it makes a person become more of a spiritual being as well as more of a human being. It helps you evolve in so many ways. It gets you out in the world. And, you know, like uh, one of your original questions, like what was the cultural diversity like when you first get into the military? And it is phenomenal. And uh, 
Uh, you meet friends that you'll never forget. Uh, you have experiences, uh, even though you know, you know there's a lot of negative experiences uh, and potential for um, um, those kind of problems. There's also potential for greatness, and you know there's just the good far outweighs anything bad that happens. And it's just so many people that get out of high school. It's like go in the military for I don't think two years is enough because you basically have a year of training and orientation mm -hmm. and on-the-job training, and that for three or four years in the military would just be so rewarding and if you don't want to stay in the military whatever branch whatever part of the service you can move on to other government jobs mm -hmm. and then you can go to you know use your benefits to go to college afterwards and sure. you'll be a mature adult with a lot of experience well John R. Bauer we want to thank you for coming in today and sharing your story with us thank you so much thank you my pleasure thank you for allowing me to do this You're uh, very welcome this is a rewarding experience for me because like I said it's taken eight years of psychotherapy and treatment for me to be able to sit down and talk like this I'm glad I did it thank you we're glad you did too